Welcome everybody to the Simons Institute. Uh, my job is to introduce several things, starting with me. Uh, I am the incoming associate director at the Institute. Uh, the Simons Institute probably needs no introduction, but um, for the few people, maybe the one person who doesn't know what it is, it is the foremost site for research collaboration in theoretical computer science. Should I do this all over again? <laughs> um, so welcome to the Simons Institute. Uh, for those who are not familiar with it, it is the foremost site for research collaborations in theoretical computer science, but with also with an outward facing um, approach. Basically, we have many interdisciplinary programs bringing together physicists, mathematicians, and other disciplines with theoretical computer science. Uh, the other thing is, this is the Richard Karp um, lectures, um, and um, I'm sure everybody in this room knows who Richard Karp is, and he needs even probably less introductions than the Simons. But just to be complete, let me say that he is um, uh, the founder of theoretical computer science and many sub areas within it, arguably. Um, and uh, he's done many major contributions, and this this uh, lecture is in honor of all of his work over his career. Um, and it's also made possible by contributions to the Richard Corp Fund by many people like you. Um, so that's that. And then finally, we get to the most important introduction. That is um, our speaker today is Noga Ronzevi from the University of Haifa. Uh, Noga is an associate professor at the university there. She's been doing some great work on error correcting codes. Um, and its relationship to complexity and algorithms. Uh, and today she'll tell us about locality in codes and computation. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very happy to give this talk and to be here at the Simons Institute. It always feels like coming back home, coming here. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you about locality in uh, error corrected codes and the theory of computation. And I'm not exactly sure what your background is. Uh, I try to make the talk accessible to many different backgrounds, uh, but uh, if you have any questions or you want more details, uh, please feel free to interrupt me and ask. Okay, so error correcting codes are uh, the subject of a research program that is uh, held at the Summons Institute this semester. And generally, error correcting codes are a method for protecting data from noise. And error correcting codes are, of course, uh, widely used in practice pretty much on any electronic device. Uh, and they are also supported by a rich theory with uh, connections with diverse disciplines in uh, math, science, and engineering. And local algorithms, also known as sublinear algorithms, are the subject of a research program that will be held in the Simons Institute next semester, this summer. And these are highly efficient algorithms that make decisions after only reading a small part of the input. So how is it at all possible to make decisions without reading the whole input? So there are mainly two uh, sources for this magic. So the first source is that these algorithms are typically randomized. So they query random locations in the input. And they also have some small chance of error. And the second source of magic is that uh, these algorithms many times don't return an exact solution, but they only return an approximate close enough solution. And of course, uh, local or sublinear algorithms are uh, very, very uh, wide, widely spread these days, given the insane amounts of data that we are processing. And they also come in many different flavors. And here are some examples of some early discoveries of such local algorithms. So in what follows, assume that we have a finite field F. For this part of the talk, you can think of F as just being the uh, uh, two element field F2 that has two elements, zero and one. And addition is replaced with the XOR operation, so we always stay inside this set. And also assume that we have a function F. Uh, that takes uh, as input k values in f and returns a single value in f. I will draw such a function in this way, which will be pretty misleading. Uh, first of all, because this drawing corresponds to the case that f only has one input, so k equals one. 
And also because this function is drawn over the reals and not over finite fields. But uh, unfortunately, that's the only thing I know how to draw. Um, OK. So here's the first example, famous example of linearity testing. So suppose we are given some function f. And we want to test whether f is a linear function, or rather it is far from any linear function. Say it differs from any linear function on more than 5% of the points. So a famous algorithm of uh, Bloom, Luby, and Rubifeld from the 90s that sort of started all this area of local algorithms in Berkeley, in Berkeley says, <laughs> as you will see, there are lots of Berkeley, Berkeley connections. Actually, all the pictures in this talk will be from research programs here at Berkeley at the Simons Institute. Um, this was early, yeah. <laughs> um, OK, so here in Berkeley in the 90s, uh, so this is a very famous algorithm that sort of started all this area of uh, local or sublinear algorithms. Uh, this algorithm uh, says that one can test this uh, with high probability by only queries three random values of f. So. The algorithm is actually pretty simple. Uh, what you can do is to pick a uniform and random, a uniform random and independent uh, uh, inputs A and B, and check whether uh, f of A plus B equals f of A plus f of B. So you pick at uniformly and independently at random A and B, you query uh, f on three points, A, B, and A plus B, and test uh, whether this equality holds. And it's not hard to see that if f is linear, then this test always passes. That's the definition of a linear function. Also, it's not hard to see that if f is not a linear function, then uh, there will be some inputs a and b that won't satisfy this identity. So the test will fail with probability greater than 0. What is less trivial to show is that if f is far from any linear function on at least 5% of the points, then the test fails with some constant probability. What's the constant? The constant depends on this 5%. And this is actually non-trivial to show. And uh, we, by now, we know of a couple of uh, different uh, proofs, uh, uh, proofs uh, for, uh, for this statement. And uh, I think the best proof uh, is based on the, the, the proof that gives the best concept is based on a Fourier analysis. One example here is another famous example, linear fitting. So suppose uh, now our given function f is close to some unknown linear function L. Say f differs from L on at most 5% of the points. And our goal now is to recover this linear function L. Then it turns out that one can recover any value of L with high probability by querying just two values of f. And the recovery algorithm is, again, pretty simple. Uh, if we want to recover the value of L at some point A, we pick uniform random point B. We query F on both A plus B and B and uh, return the difference. And then our analysis here is actually straightforward. Suppose that F uh, differs from L on at most 5% of the points. Then since B is uniform random, with probability at most uh, 0 0.5, we will have a uh, that uh, f uh, and l differ on b. And if we fix a, since b is uniform random, we will also have that a plus b is uniform random. Therefore, again, with probability at most 0 .0, 0 0.05, we will have that f and l differ on a plus b. So with probability, say, at most 0.1, uh, so these two bad events happen with probability at most 0 0.1. So with probability at least 0.9, None of these events happen, and we get that uh, F and L agree on both A plus B and B, and uh, therefore we get the right value. So the algorithm and the analysis is very simple. One last example. Suppose that we again want to solve this linear fitting uh, question, but in the high uh, error, high noise re regime. So again, we have a given function f that is close to some unknown known linear function l. Uh, but now we have more noise. We assume that f and l can differ on at most 49% of the points. In that case, it turns out that l may not be unique. 
So there may be two uh, close bilinear functions. And the famous algorithm of Goldbach and Levine from the 90s says that in this case, for any solution L, we can recover any value of L with high probability by creating just the constant number of values of F. Here the algorithm is uh, slightly less straightforward. So what can we do? So first of all, uh, we pick a uniform random independent uh, inputs B1 to Bt for some constant T. This constant depends on the 49. And then one can show that with high probability, the values V1 to Vt of L on B1 to Bt determine the function L. Now suppose that we want to recover the value of L uh, that is determined by V1 to Vt on some point A. So we compute all values F of A plus Bi minus Vi, and then take the majority vote, the most common value. And the idea is that suppose that F is at most 49% close to L, then since all uh, uh, points B1 to Bt are uniform and independent, for a fixed A also all point A plus Bi are uniform, random and independent. So by concentration bounds, we will get by, with high probability that F on L agree on uh, more than 50% uh, of the point A plus Bi, in which case this majority will give us the right answer. Any questions so far? Okay, and it turns out that uh, uh, all these local, uh, famous local algorithms from the 90s uh, can actually be viewed as uh, local algorithms for error correcting codes. So to explain this connection, I first describe in more detail what are error correcting codes. So in an error correcting code, we have a message that we want to send through a noisy channel. And for this, we first encode the message via an error correcting code, and then send the resulting code word through the channel. And this result is some corrupted version of the code word. And our goal now is to recover the original message. More formally, a code is defined over some alphabet sigma. For example, sigma could be just the binary alphabet, 0 and 1. And a code is a map that maps messages, which are strings of length k over sigma, to code words, which are strings of length n over sigma. We call k the message length and the code word length. And the two main parameters of the code are the rate R of the code, which is the ratio between the message length K and the code word length N. And it measures the amount of redundancy in encoding. So usually in order to uh, correct errors, we need N to be larger than K. So the rate is some number between zero and one. We want it to be as high as possible, as close to one as possible. And the second parameter is the distance. So a code has distance delta if any two code words differ on at least delta fraction of the points. And, uh, the, and if this happens, then C is resilient to delta over two fraction of errors. And this is the picture. These are, this is the space of all strings of length n over sigma. These are the code words, which are some very special subset of sigma to the n, very special subset of strings. And we know that any two code words are at least delta far apart. So if we draw balls of radius delta over two around each code word, then all these balls should be disjoint. And therefore, if less than delta over two fraction of errors occurs, then we uh, stay inside a code, inside some ball, and we know that the center of this ball must be the code word that was transmitted. And there are two main algorithmic tasks that are associated with error correcting codes. The first task is testing in which one would like to detect if an error occurs. Or in, or in other words, given sub w, one would like to decide whether w is a code word. The second task is decoding, in which one would like to correct errors. Or in other words, given some string w, one would like to find the message n so that the encoding of n is closest to w. And classically, algorithms for error correction and error detection would read and process the entire string w. And locally testable and locally decodable codes, which are the subjects of this talk, are codes that have sublinear time error detection and error correction algorithms. So they can detect and correct errors without uh, reading or preprocessing the entire string W. In more detail, in locally testable code, LTCs, we have a string W, and we would like to determine whether W is a code word. And for this, we have a local tester. 
the local tester tosses a few random coins. Based on this, it queries a few locations in W. And then it decides whether to accept and reject. To accept or reject. And the requirements are that if W is a code word, then the local tester will always accept. It will accept it for ability one. And on the other hand, if W is not a code word, then the local tester will reject with probability that is proportional to the distance of W to the closest code word. And some dependence the, on the distance here is necessary because if W is very close to some code word with high probability, when we query random locations, we won't see any difference between W and the code word. So we should have some dependency. So this is a local tester. And a locally decodable code, LDCs, is a code where we are given some word W that is delta over two close to some code word C. And we are also given some index I. Then the local decoder tosses a few random coins. Based on this, it makes a few queries to W. And then it outputs the ith message bit. And the requirements are that for any uh, string W and for any index I, uh, the local decoder will output the ith message bit with a high probability, say 0.99. Now suppose that W is not delta two over two close to some code word. This is alpha close to some code word for alpha, which is much greater than delta over two. In that case, uh, the code word, the closest code word may not be uniquely determined. There may be multiple options. And uh, this can be handled using something that is called locally least decodable codes. The definition is a bit involved, so I won't give it here. But roughly the idea is that we output a list or a collection of local decoders. And one for each close by code word. And the main parameters of interests of uh, uh, LTCs and LDCs are, first of all, the classical parameters of the code, the rate R, the ratio between the message length K and the code word length N, uh, the distance delta, which is the minimum fraction of coordinates on which any two code words differ. And also, we have here the, the, the locality parameter, the query complexity, Q which is the number of, of queries made to the corrupted code word. So these are the three main parameters of interest. Any questions so far? OK, great. Good, so these are error correcting codes. And the linear functions that we discussed at the beginning of this talk can be uh, actually viewed as error correcting codes as follows. So this code will be defined over an alphabet, which is a finite field FP for a prime P. So this field will contain the number 0, 1 to P minus 1. Uh, and arithmetic will be done mod P. So if we multiply or we add the numbers, we get numbers uh, greater than P. We, we, take, we divide by P and take the remainder. Um, and since P prime, uh, arithmetic operations behave the way we, we think they should behave. And in the Adamart code, uh, we interpret a message M as a linear function where uh, the entries in the message are the coefficients of this linear function. And then the encoding of this function is that just uh, we evaluate this linear function over all field elements. And then the distance of the, this code is 1 minus 1 over P. This follows from the fact that linear functions are equidistributed, so they take the same they take any field element, uh, uh, they take as value uh, any field element the same number of times. So if we take two linear functions, the difference will also be a linear function. And that function will take the value 0 at most 1 over p fraction of the times. So this means that these two linear functions uh, agree at most 1 over p fraction of the times. So this is great. We can get distance arbitrarily close to 1 if p is sufficiently large. What is the rate? So the rate is the message length over code word length. In this case, message length is just the number of coefficients of the linear function. Code word length is the number of evaluation points. We have k coefficients, and we have a p to the k evaluations, because we have k variables, and each one can take any one of p values in the field. And this is not so good, because uh, uh, the rate decays. It decays very fast, exponentially fast, uh, as the message length grows. And 
now the algorithm, the free query algorithm for linearity testing that we discussed before is actually an algorithm uh, for testing whether a string is the evaluation table of some linear function, whether it's a Damad code word. So this can be thought of as a free query local testing for a Damad code. And then the algorithm for linear fitting that we discussed is just an algorithm to recover the uh, closest linear function, the closest to the mod code word. So that can be thought as a, a two query local decoding algorithm for the mod code. And the linear fitting in the high rate, in the high noise regime can uh, uh, similarly be, th be thought of as a constant query local list decoding algorithm for the mod code. And these ideas can also be extended to higher degree polynomials. So these are reed muller codes, famous codes from the 60s. Um, and in this code, similarly to the linear code case, uh, one interprets a message as a polynomial P in K variables of degree at most D over FP. And then coding of some message of some polynomial is again just the evaluations everywhere. And the rate as before is message F over code word length, which is number of coefficients over number of evaluations. Uh, number, number of evaluations is just as before, p to the k. Uh, but the advantage now is that number of coefficients is number of uh, monomials. Number of monomials in k variables of degree at most d. We have k plus d choose k, k such monomials. And therefore, we can get higher rate than in uh, the linear code case. The message length is larger. And the distance is now one minus d over p. This follows from the schwarz sipel lemma that says that two degree d polynomial uh, have at most d over p fraction of zeros. So again, if we take two degree d polynomials, we uh, take their difference. It's again a degree d polynomial. This polynomial can have at most d over p fraction of errors, fraction of zeros. And therefore, the original polynomial can differ at most d over p fraction of points. What about locality? So we get locality because the restriction, uh, one reason we can get locality is because the restriction to any line is a degree d polynomial. So for example, we can have a local decoder in this way. So if we want to recover some point A, we shoot a random line through A, and then interpolate a polynomial through all points on the line and recover this way the uh, value of A. And Correctness follows since any point on a random line through A is uniform random. Therefore, if we globally don't have too many errors, then with high probability on a random line, we won't have errors. And a local tester, to local test, you just pick a random line and you accept if and only if the restriction to a line is degree D polynomial. And again, local testing here, the, anal the analysis is, not is non trivial. That's usually the case in local tester. They're pretty easy usually to state, but the analysis is not trivial. And what's a query complexity? Query complexity is just number of points on the line, which is P. Okay, so we have uh, these amazing uh, Hadamard code and Riedmuller codes, which are with us since the 60s, and they are known to be locally testable and locally decodable since the 90s. And in more recently, researchers discovered some variants of these codes that uh, achieve better performance. So first of all, we have this old cousin of Friedmuller codes, which are low degree extension, uh, which are basically a variant in which instead of having low total degree, we have low individual degree. So each uh, variable has low degree. So these codes are known to be locally testable uh, again from the 90s, but more recently there has been an improved analysis that gives a better performance. And later, there were also these matching vector codes. Uh, these are, which can be, be viewed as the polynomials that have some selected set of monomials and are evaluated on some uh, a selected set of points. And the advantage is that we have less evaluation points and therefore the, the code length is uh, shortened and we have a higher rate. And then there were multiplicity codes. The idea in multiplicity codes is to evaluate polynomials and also their derivatives. It turns out that if you evaluate also derivatives, you can work with higher degree polynomials, which again gives you higher rate, it gives you more polynomials. And finally, there were lifted codes, which are very interesting codes. So 
the idea I lifted code is to define the code uh, with the, according to the property that we want. So if you remember in the read Wunner codes, the property that gave us locality is that the restriction to any line was a degree D polynomial. So the idea in lifted code is to define the code this way, to ask for codes in which the restriction to any line is a degree D polynomial. So read Wunner codes certainly satisfy this property, but it turns out that in some, which it was pretty a surprise, in some regime of parameters, there are codes which are not read Muller codes that satisfy this property. And in fact, they have many more code words than read Muller codes, much higher rate. Okay, great. So we have all these amazing polynomial based codes. Uh, but at some point, the question that came into mind is whether we can do something else, whether we can locally test and locally decode things which are not polynomials. Um, so one candidate that comes to mind are expander codes. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, well-known expander codes of Sipser and Spielman from the 90s. In these codes, we have a bipartite graph with left degree A, right degree B. And the, all the left vertices correspond to codeboard bits. And all the right vertices correspond to parity checks. So all the right, ver each right vertex checks that its neighborhood, the XOR of its neighborhood is zero. And the purpose of the party checks is to check that the left side is a valid code word. So code word is valid if and only if all party checks are satisfied. And the expansion property that is uh, typically used is the following. We want that any left subset that is not too large, say of size at least delta n, has many neighbors. So since the left degree is A, if we take a left subset S, the number of neighbors could be at most A times the size of S. And we want to have roughly the same number of neighbors. And it turns out that since we have so many neighbors, we must also have something that is called unique neighbor. So there must be a right vertex that is a neighbor of just one element inside S. So for example, in this picture, P1 is a unique neighbor. It has only one neighbor inside S. And this property is useful because, for example, it gives you distance. So how can we show that this code has distance? So suppose that we have two different code words. So both satisfy all parity checks. Their difference should also satisfy all parity checks. So if we look at their difference, uh, the different set, the set of uh, points on which they differ, must have size at least delta n. Why? If it has size less than delta n, so suppose the different set was a set S of size less than delta n, it will have a unique neighbor. And for that unique neighbor, the constraint will not be satisfied because it will see just a single uh, non-zero entry. And therefore, the different set must be large. And the same reasoning also gives a iterative linear time decoding algorithm, which is what expander codes are famous for. Can these codes be locally testable? So there is a very uh, straightforward uh, candidate for local test. Just pick a random parity check and check that it's satisfied. Uh, so apparently this is known to not be a local test. So if, we, if you make this test, then any code word will pass with probability one. Uh, anything that is non-code word will be uh, rejected with probability greater than zero, but you won't get high probability uh, rejection. Um, so for us, for some time, it's, it wasn't known how, what to do. Uh, till a recent breakthrough uh, that introduced uh, high dimensional expanders. Uh, so these are sort of generalization of exa expanders for which uh, you can uh, locally test. Uh, so there are a couple of uh, different ways to do this. I will uh, present uh, some uh, simplified construction from uh, recent work. Um, so the very high level, the idea is this. So we have the same graph like we had before. But now we add a lot, another level. So we add the same type of graph here. Uh, and now these are, we are going to be meta checks. So these are, again, code word bits. This level is party checks, and we'll have another level of meta checks. And the purpose of the meta checks are to check that the left side are party checks of a valid string. So they come from party checks of a real string. And then the high level idea of, 
of uh, showing that that this gives the local test is that if W is not a code word, then some priority checks should fail. But because we have this level of meta checks, this actually says that many priority checks will fail. Why? Because if a small number of priority check will fail, then because of a, a because this is an expander, we will get that some meta check will fail. And therefore, this means that this pattern of parity checks is not a valid, uh, it's, it does not come from a valid string. So this can't happen. Great. How much time do I have? You won't object, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this means that you are not asking enough questions. In fact, you are not asking any questions. <laughs> <laughs> you have questions. Okay. Right, yeah. Try asking questions. Yeah. The last okay. application, you say many parity checks fail. Do you mean at the meta check level or at the parity? At the parity. So the test so. will be at the parity level. You pick a random parity check mm -hmm. and we'll check that uh, it's satisfied, that the neighbors is mm -hmm. zero. Mm -hmm. And uh, because this is a, an and because of the property of, because we define the code this way, if W is not a code, there will be some parity check that will fail. Mm -hmm. But because of the structure here, we must have that many parity checks will fail. And the point is basically you have redundant parity checks then. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Okay, yeah. You yeah, always yeah. need redundancy in order yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I get it. Yeah. yeah. What do the meta checks look like? Are they also nice? I mean, the parity checks are parity. Yeah, the meta checks are like parity, parity checks. They just. What? Meta checks are just like parity checks that check parity, but the purpose is different. The purpose of the parity checks are to check that this, the left string here is a code word. The purpose of the meta checks is to check that this string is a valid parity check pattern of some other string. Yeah, so the meta checks are only used in the analysis, but not in the testing algorithm. That's right, exactly. Any more questions? Okay, thanks for making an effort to ask that. <laughs> 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 okay, what about local decoding? So we currently don't know how to local decode these expander code or high dimensional expanders, but we do have some constructions of LDCs that are based on local decoding. So first of all, we know that if we take a bipartite expander and we place the party checks with uh, checks that check that the left side is a, a itself a short LDC, that the neighborhood is itself a, a LDC of short length, then this will give some local decoding properties. And expanders are also used as ingredients in some LDC constructions. But we don't currently know how to utilize a high dimensional expanders, for example, for LDCs. That's an interesting question. Okay. So now I would like to talk a bit about the uh, applications of locally decodable codes. Uh, I will talk mainly about one application, just flash the rest of the applications. So the application I want to focus on is to uh, something called probabilistically checkable proofs, PCPs. So PCPs are a new format for writing proofs that are not much longer than standard conventional proofs. And these proofs, pretty amazingly, can be verified probabilistically by just uh, making a few queries to the proof, a few random queries to the proof. There is this uh, famous, well-known PCP theorem from the 90s uh, that says that any NP statement, any statement that can be any theorem that can be verified in polynomial time and using a proof of polynomial length, also has a PCP with constant number of queries and polynomial length. And a useful property in PCPs is that the proof itself is a code word code word of certain structure, and that sort of aids in verification. And if you want the proof to be a code word, you also need a mechanism to check that uh, the prover indeed uh, provided a valid code word. And for this, it's useful that the uh, code is LTC and LDC. If it's LTC, you can, uh, using a few queries, check that, the, co that uh, the proof is close to some valid code word. And then if it's also an LDC, then you can retrieve any value of this closed by code word by making a few queries to the proof. And traditionally, the codes that would be used in PCPs were polynomial-based codes. Is the LDC property, strictly speaking, necessary to prove PCP? 
many times, I mean, there are many kinds of PCPs, but many times is, is, it's useful. Why? Because LTCs only guarantee that you are close to some code word, right? You will make a few queries. If you are far from a code word, you will reject. Uh, if you accept that you, you know that you are probably uh, close to a code word. And then if you want to retrieve points in that code word, you need the LDC property. You know that your proof is, is close to a code word and you want to access to the real code word. That makes sense. Uh, and traditionally, the codes that will be used as LTCs, and LTCs are probably based codes, basically low degree extension with Muller. And probabilistically checkable proofs, PCPs, uh, besides being uh, very interesting and natural objects uh, on their own, also have uh, other uh, very uh, interesting and important applications. So one uh, important application of PCPs has been to uh, showing harness of approximation. So basically, if you look at all the checks that the verifier does for any query set, if you can tell whether all these possible checks are satisfied or whether just a small fraction of them are satisfied, because of the PCP theorem, if you, if you can do that, you can solve NP-hard problems. So this gives a, some constraint satisfaction question, some a problem that is hard to approximate. If you could approximate that, you could solve any NP problem. Uh, and from that problem, you can take this problem as a starting point and, and show reduction for many other problems that are hard to approximate. And in recent years, there has been an interest in a fine-grained hardness of approximation, which you really care about a very tight uh, bounds on the running time. And once you go into this regime of fine-grained hardness of approximation, you care about very efficient PCPs, highly efficient PCPs. So one thing, for example, you would like is to have very short PCPs. So the original PCP theorem from the 90s gave a PCP of polynomial length. But here you have, we want very short proof. You, add, you want a proof uh, whose length approaches the length of the original NP, NP proof, the original proof. And another application of PCPs has been to something called succinct arguments. So succinct arguments are basically very short proofs, say proofs of logarithmic length. Uh, but they, they are only secure, assuming the cheating proving, prover is computationally bounded. Um, and such proofs have been lately used in, in practice for cryptocurrencies uh, purposes, for showing, uh, um, for giving privacy, providing privacy for cryptocurrencies. And there again, we need a very high efficiency. We uh, many times want uh, that the proof will be generated very fast, say linear time. So we don't currently know to how to get such strong properties out of PCPs. Uh, but in recent work, we were uh, able to, to get these properties uh, for a related model where we allow a small number of communication routes between the prover and the verifier. And this turns out to suffice for some of these applications. And the main new ingredient in these proofs is that we, uh, as, uh, we, we don't use no, uh, polynomial codes. So I told you traditionally most PCPs use polynomial codes and we managed to bypass it and use non-polynomial codes. This is very related to Gilles' talk. Where, where is Gilles? Yeah. So Gilles gave a talk, if you, if you have been to the colloquium uh, this afternoon, he gave a talk about a multiplication property of polynomial codes. And it turns out that this property is, is very uh, useful for PCP construction. And the main idea here was somehow to bypass this property. Um, No, these are for uh, PCPs, but with uh, multiple rounds. Like the prover is uh, not, a, the, it's secure against, against any prover. No, I mean, uh -huh. can get, uh, can get Ah, can get both, short NP proof and linear. Um, and this model turns out to suffice for some of these applications. Yeah. Do we know how to get uh, hardness of approximation from this uh, from these proofs? Uh, no, hardness of approximation. This mainly has application to this setting. But that's a very good question. I think there should be. But I don't know. Yes. 
Um, so is this like uh, a linear length proof with like sort of like adaptive queries or? No, it's a, the, the queries are not adaptive. Uh, the, the, the proof is linear. Not only it's linear, it approaches the NP proof. Oh, okay. You can get arbitrarily close to the original. We guessed it. <laughs> Sorry, uh, maybe I'm misremembering, but I thought, is it, uh, is it actually constant number of communication rooms? I thought it was uh, logarithmic, or am I thinking of? Um, am I thinking okay, of? there might be, there are a couple of different works. I think the yeah. first one was constant number of rounds. Uh, that one may be logarithmic, or maybe uh, even logarithmic. Yeah. Okay, okay. Right. That one may be also constant. I don't even imagine. You are right. Yeah. Oh, when you're using multiple polynomial codes, uh, there are some results of Penrose stylings and aperiodic tiles, potentially. Uh, what, what are some examples of structure that uh, the kind of objects would be? Could, what structure do they have? Yeah. They, they resemble a bit these uh, expander codes. They have like local constraints. Right. Okay, and besides this application of PCPs, which is one main application of local code, there have also been other applications of local codes. Um, so for example, local codes have other applications in cryptography that I didn't discuss, cryptography and privacy, uh, also in pseudo-randomness, other simplification. Do you recognize the picture? <laughs> so there are algorithms, learning theory, so where are all these pictures from? Here, right. So all these pictures are from programs at the Service Institute. So I think this shows the centrality of, of these codes. By the way, I think that one main contribution of the Service Institute, besides the big home and the science and everything, is they having uh, lots of uh, beautiful pictures by graphic designers on any area of PCP that you can put on your slides. Um, OK, so there are many other applications that I didn't touch upon. And also, related notion of locality, uh, are also used in practice in a distributed storage system. Okay, so let's summarize. Um, so what I try to convey at least at the beginning of this talk is that local testing or decoding algorithms are uh, actually natural objects of study in the context of sublinear algorithms. Uh, they have many applications in theory of interpretation. I just described the PCPs and, and their applications, but there are many more applications. And they're also used in practice in distributed storage systems. Some open problems. So, uh, did I say something about C to the three LTC? I think uh, it just popped up and I didn't say. So this uh, um, construction that I show you about high dimensional expanders, that one led to the resolution of a very, uh, long, very famous and long standing open problem about C to the three LTCs. So basically this was used to get LTCs that have three constants. Constant rate, constant distance, and constant locality. This was a question that was open for a long time. And that was done using graph-based codes using high-dimensional expander. Uh, for LDCs, we know that uh, you can't have C to the three LDCs, but can you get optimal C to the C uh, cube, C, C square LDCs? Um, so what do I mean by optimal C square LDCs? By this, I mean that I fix two parameters and I want to be optimal in the third parameter. So for example, if I fix the rate and the distance to be constant, these are called asymptotically good codes, what is the optimal number of queries? So what we know is that the number of queries should be at least log n and at most two to the square root log n. So it's an exponential gap. Uh, and we don't know what's the true answer. Likely, if we uh, fix number of queries to be constant and distance to be constant, then we know that the length is something between n square and something exponential to log n to the epsilon. Again, it's nearly exponential gap. So it will be really nice to close this gap and this gap and understand what is the true answer. So this, by the way, is obtained via multiplicity code and expander-based constructions, and this is obtained via matching code. Can we get also C square LT PCPs? So in PCPs, we have two main parameters of interest number of queries and the legs, the rate. Can we get PCPs with constant number of queries and constant rate? So if we focus on constant number of queries, the best length we know is n poly log n. Can we get order of n? If we assume we have constant rate or linear length, then number of queries is at most n to the epsilon. Can we get constant number of queries? That's it, thank you.
distance. What is the epsilon? I mean, for the uh, I would call it small constant. I mean, that is, isn't that a uh, sort of polynomial? Yeah. The, the right hand side is followed through. Yeah. Ah, oh, sorry, it should have been a. Uh, uh, it's x to x, sorry. It's x to, x to the log n. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Um, is there an intuitive reason why you can't have C3 LTCs, or is it like, not intuitive why you can't satisfy um, There is a proof for that. Katz Trevisan again from the 90s. Um, I don't know if I, I have an intuitive explanation. Does anything happen? I don't know. I don't have an intuitive explanation, but there is a proof for that. Um, so what does this C3 LTC or like C, C, well, LDC imply for PCPs? Um, so I'm not sure they will have a direct implication to LDCs, to uh, PCPs, uh, but, but they, are, they are also interesting objects on their own. I see. I see. So even if you get like this optimal C2 well, LDC together with this already known C3 well, LTC, Unclear, unclear. Yeah, actually, obtaining C2 with three LTCs was very kind of thought as a benchmark to obtaining this. But now we have this, we don't know yet. Any other questions? Thank you, Noga. <laughs>